In this video, I'm going to talk about basic definitions and examples of sets and subsets. This material is probably already familiar to a lot of you, but one of the purposes of this video is to establish notation and to be specific about definitions so that there's no ambiguity or misunderstanding when we get to later parts of the subject. Still, I am going to assume some familiarity here, so I will move rather quickly. First of all, we all probably know that a set is an unordered collection of distinct objects. The objects of the set are called the members or the elements of the set. To give a few simple examples, here is the set consisting of the numbers 1, 5, and 13. Of course, sets don't have to consist entirely of numbers. They can consist of any kinds of objects that we want to put in there. So here's the set containing the letter A, the number 2, a triangle, and a smiley face. And here's the set consisting of the six congruent triangles obtained by rigid motion starting from an equilateral triangle in the plane. If you watch the first video, then you can see why we want to think about sets as abstract objects. This is a set that's going to come up again in later lectures. Another familiar example is the set of positive integers, also sometimes called the set of natural numbers. The three dots here, of course, is supposed to indicate that some hopefully obvious pattern continues. In this case, our human brain knows that the pattern is just increasing each of the numbers by one as you go to the right. One common notation for this set is to write a blackboard style Z with a plus sign as a superscript. The blackboard style Z here, of course, is the notation for the set of all integers. Another common notation for this set is to write it as a blackboard style N. One thing to be aware of, though, is that this notation can sometimes be ambiguous because sometimes people use the same symbol to denote the set of non-negative integers, which includes this set, but also the integer zero. Anyway, in almost all of my lectures, I use Blackboard N to denote the set of positive integers, and I also refer to it as the set of natural numbers. I already mentioned that Blackboard Z is the symbol for the set of integers, that is, the set of all whole numbers. I'm not going to write whole numbers here, because unfortunately that's also confusing to some people who define the whole numbers to also be the set of non-negative integers. Almost all mathematicians that I've talked to would say that the whole numbers is the same as the collection of all integers, but to avoid controversy and ambiguity, I'll just try not to use that phrase. Finally, this is another very important example of a set, but when you look inside the curly braces, you can see that it doesn't have any elements. The set with no elements is denoted by the Greek letter phi, and it's referred to as the empty set. It's also important at the beginning here that we establish some notation to indicate whether or not a certain object is an element of a set. So suppose that capital A is a set and that little a is some object. If little a is an element of the set capital A, then we will denote that as written here. The little symbol in the middle that looks like a small curved E means is an element of. If we want to indicate that the object A is not an element of the set A, then we'll use the same symbol, but we'll draw a line through it. So this notation means that little a is not an element of the set big A. There are many circumstances where we're going to want to talk about the number of elements in a set A. If A is a finite set, in other words, if it only has finitely many elements, then we will refer to the number of elements of A as the cardinality of A. There are several different common notations for the cardinality of a set. Usually we will just write the set with absolute values around it, but sometimes we may put a hashtag in front of the set, and sometimes we may write card A to denote the cardinality of the set. This is pretty simple, but just to make sure that we all understand it, let's take a few of the sets from our previous slide. The cardinality of the set consisting of the numbers 1, 5, and 13 is 3, because it has 3 elements. Similarly, the cardinality of the set of rigid motions of an equilateral triangle is 6. And also, it's important to realize that the cardinality of the empty set is 0, because it doesn't have any elements in it. For the purposes of these lectures, if A is not a finite set, then we're just going to say that its cardinality is infinite, and we're going to write absolute value of A equals infinity. Many of you probably know that there's a finer notion of cardinality that you can use to distinguish between certain infinite sets, but that's not really the focus of the topic here, so we'll just stick with simply saying that infinite sets have infinite cardinality. There are two basic ways of describing sets. The first is what's called set roster notation, and it's simply where you write a list of the elements of a set enclosed by curly braces. All of the examples that I've shown you so far 
were written using set roster notation. But just to make sure that we understand this, and also to look at some of the subtleties here, let's explore a couple more examples. Suppose that a set A is presented to you like this. How many elements would you say that this set has? And what are the elements of the set? If this is your first time seeing an example like this, then it may be confusing to see so many curly braces. But you should think of the two curly braces on the far left and the far right as being the main ones that enclose the list of all of the elements of the set A. The elements of the set A are separated by commas. And sometimes, like in the examples that we saw before, there could also be ellipses to indicate that some hopefully obvious pattern continues. Anyway, in this example, the elements of the set A are the number one and the set containing the number one. Now, the number one and the set containing the number one are not the same thing. The first one is just the number one, and the other one is a set. It's the set containing the number one. These two objects are the distinct elements of the set A, so this set has cardinality two. Now, to really make sure that we understand this, let's look at one more example. In this one, we've sort of gone wild and thrown sets inside of sets and even sets inside of sets inside of sets. So focusing on just the set A, how many elements would you say that it has? Well, we just look at the left and rightmost curly braces and all of the elements of A are listed in there separated by commas. The first element of A is the empty set. It's a set and a set is an object so it can be an element of another set. As a side comment, I'd like to mention that we're taking the point of view of what is called naive set theory here. So we're ignoring all of the possible contradictions like Russell's paradox that could come from a statement like that. Anyway, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can just forget about that because it is in fact true that the empty set can be an element of another set. Continuing with this example, the next element that we've listed here is the number two. And the next element is the set containing the letters A and B. Even though this set has two objects sitting inside of it, the set by itself is just one object, so it only counts as one element of the set capital A. Just to emphasize this point, it's not true that little a is an element of capital A or that little b is an element of capital A. They are not elements of capital A. The set containing little a and little b is an element of capital A, and little a and little b are elements of that set. But the property of being elements of a set is not in general a transitive property. The final element of the set capital A, which is also the most complicated one, is the set containing one and the set containing one. That big set is an element of the set capital A. So the cardinality of the set capital A in the second example is four. Now there's another common way of describing sets and it's using what is called set builder notation. Set builder notation specifies a collection of elements and a collection of conditions and it picks out the collection of all elements which satisfy those conditions. You have very likely seen this notation before in one of the two forms that I'm showing you here. To use set builder notation, you use curly braces to enclose your set, and then you specify a collection of elements and a collection of conditions, separated usually by either a colon or a vertical line. I may use either or both of these notations in my lectures. This notation is especially useful when you're trying to filter out elements of a set that you've already constructed by imposing some collection of conditions on them. Let's look at a few examples of sets that are described using set builder notation. First, think about what set this is describing. This is the set of all integers n, which satisfy the condition that n is bigger than or equal to zero. Of course, this is just a way of writing the non-negative integers. And the notation that we'll use for this set is a blackboard z with a subscript of greater than or equal to zero. How about this set? This is the set of all real numbers x, which can be written as p over q, where p is an integer and q is a natural number. The blackboard r here is the symbol for real numbers, and the set that I just described is the set of rational numbers, which we denote by blackboard q. Another important example of a set constructed using set builder notation is the set of all real numbers which are not rational. This is called the set of irrational numbers. We're not going to introduce a symbol for it, 
because there's not really a universally agreed upon symbol for the set of irrational numbers. Later on, when we talk about set operations, we can describe this set pretty easily as r set minus q, or as the complement of q inside of r. But don't worry about that right now. Finally, let's talk about notation for and examples of subsets. If a and b are two sets, then we say that a is a subset of b if every element of a is also an element of b. The notation for this is what you see here, and the symbol in the middle is like a sideways u with a bar under it. Some people use this notation without the bar under it, but since that can also be confused with meaning that a is a proper subset of b, which I'll define in a minute, I prefer to stick with this notation. Now, if a is not a subset of b, then it's almost the same notation, except we draw a line through the subset sign. To put this a slightly different way, if we say that a is not a subset of b, that means that there's at least one element of a which is not an element of b. Coming back to a word that I just mentioned, if we say that a is a proper subset of b, what we mean is that a is a subset of b and a is not equal to b. To say it another way, a is a proper subset of b if every element of a is an element of b and if there's at least one element of b which is not an element of a. Now, it may be important to clarify here what we mean when we say that two sets are equal or not equal. And the definition is probably what you think it is. Two sets are equal if and only if they have exactly the same elements. Remember that sets are unordered, so it doesn't matter what order you choose to write down the elements of a set. And they also consist of distinct elements. So a priori, there's no notion of how many times a given element is listed in a set. So from that point of view, it makes sense to say that two sets are equal if and only if they have the same elements. Now in practice, when you're trying to show that two sets are equal, it's useful to have this equivalent formulation in your mind. Two sets A and B are going to be equal to each other if and only if every element of A is also an element of B and every element of B is also an element of A. In other words, A equals B if and only if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. When you're trying to write down a proof that two sets are equal, this is sometimes useful to keep in mind. Okay, let's conclude by looking at some examples. First of all, I hope you believe me that the set of integers is a subset of the set of rational numbers, but that the set of rational numbers is not a subset of the set of integers. The statement on the left is true because, for example, if n is any integer, we can always write it as n divided by 1. By the definition that we gave of the set of rational numbers, that qualifies n to be a rational number. So the set of integers is a subset of the set of rational numbers. How about the other way around? Is it true that every rational number is an integer? Well, of course not, and here's an example. The number 1 half is a rational number, but it's not an integer. If there's even one element of the set on the left that's not an element of the set on the right, then it means that the set on the left is not a subset of the set on the right. So the rationals are not a subset of the integers. Similarly, the rationals are a subset of the real numbers. That's really a consequence of the way that the real numbers are constructed in analysis. So we won't say too much about it here, but it is a true statement. On the other hand, there are real numbers that are not rational. One example of a number like that is the square root of 2. The square root of 2 is a real number, but it can't be written as a fraction. This is not completely obvious, but a lot of you probably know how to prove this, and it's not too difficult either. Next, an important fact that you need to know is that for any set A, the empty set is always a subset of A, and A itself is also a subset of A. The second statement here should be pretty obvious to most people just because of the definition. Every element of A is an element of A. The first statement here is also true, and it's an example of what's called a vacuous truth. To check that the empty set is a subset of A, I need to check that for every element of the empty set, that element is also an element of A. But since there are no elements of the empty set, there's nothing to check. So by the rules of logic, this is always a true statement. Finally, one more example to keep our brains flexible. Let's let A be the set whose elements are the number one and the set containing two. Then the set containing one is a subset of the set A. 
Just think about the definition of subset. On the left-hand side, I have the set containing one. Is every element of that set an element of A? Well, the only element of the set on the left-hand side is the number one, and the number one is an element of A. So the set containing the number one is a subset of the set containing A. Now, on the other hand, the number one itself is not a subset of the set containing A. The number one is an element of the set A, but by itself, it's not even a set. And so it doesn't make sense to say that the number one is a subset of the set A. For something to be a subset of something else, first of all, both of the things have to actually be sets. Also, by the same kind of reasoning, the set containing the set containing two is a subset of A. But the set containing two itself is not a subset of A. The explanation for the first part here is similar to before. Look at every element of the set on the left-hand side here. Well, there's only one. The only element of this set is the set containing two. Now, is that element an element of the set on the right? Well, yes, the set containing two is an element of the set A. Since every element of the set on the left is an element of the set on the right, the set containing the set containing two is a subset of the set A. But don't get confused because the set containing two itself is not a subset of A. Now here we can't excuse ourselves like we did on the previous example because the thing on the left-hand side is actually a set this time, but we need to ask the question, is every element of the set on the left also an element of the set on the right? Well, the number two is an element of the set on the left, but the number two is not an element of the set A. The set containing the number two is an element of A, but the number two itself is not an element of A. Therefore, the set containing two is not a subset of the set A. Now, this is a small example. Let's go ahead and list out all of the subsets of A. When you're trying to list out all of the subsets of a finite set, sometimes a good way to organize them is to go in order of increasing cardinality of subsets. So first of all, we start with subsets of cardinality zero. And of course, there's only one, the empty set. Remember, the empty set is a subset of any set, so it needs to be in this list. Now that we've exhausted all of the subsets of cardinality zero, we look at the subsets of cardinality one. Subsets of cardinality one are called singleton sets, by the way. To list out the singleton sets of the set A, we can just go in order through each of its elements. First, there's the set containing the element one, and then there's the set containing the set containing two. Now that we've exhausted all of the singleton sets, we can think about all of the subsets of A of cardinality two. This is a pretty easy example though, because the set A itself has cardinality two. And so the only way to pick out a subset of A which also has cardinality two is to take both of its elements and throw them into the set. That means that this is a complete list of all of the subsets of the set A. Well, that's the end of this video. We're going to have a lot more to say about sets and set operations in a later video. The next video is going to be about logical statements.